Good morning. I'm Victor Balta, Assistant Vice President for Communications and Spokesperson here at the University of Washington. I'm pleased to welcome all of you who have joined us here in the Alder Hall Auditorium, as well as, the, as, well as those of you watching online to the 2024 Provost Town Hall. Before we begin, I want to note that Provost Serio will be taking questions at the conclusion of the Town Hall. For the sake of fairness between in-person and remote in attendees, we ask that anyone who has a question to submit it to provost at uw.edu. Given our limited time today, Provost Serio will be the only one to take questions. If you have a question for the speakers, you may also send it to provost at uw.edu and our team will forward it on. And now, it is my pleasure to introduce the President of the University of Washington, Anamari Kausi. So nice to see you all. Thank you so much, Victor, and thank you all for coming out. Uh, really appreciate it. And thank you all that are um, watching from your desks, from your homes, maybe even from a beach somewhere. Um, we, really, we really welcome you. And I am honored and delighted to be introducing Provo Sirio, or as we all call her, Tricia, at her very first official town hall at the University of Washington. She is the University of Washington Provost and Executive Vice President for Academic Affairs. And since she started in August, she's quickly become familiar to all of us on this campus. And many of you, I guess, have seen her walking across campus uh, during lunchtime. Um, you've seen her maybe dressed all in purple for a football game or all in purple for hanging out at her office. Um, and, uh, you know, she really, for many of you, she really needs no introduction because she very quickly has become a familiar face. From the very first day that she arrived, she has thrown herself in to learning all about what this makes this great university such a special place. And I've really, you know, loved watching her learn and discover and get excited about who we are and what we can do here. Um, again, she's thrown herself into it, body and soul. And she's devoted considerably a lot of time and talent into finding ways to support and improve our collective ability to advance discovery, learning, and opportunity. As the University of Washington's Chief Academic and Budget Officer, Tricia leads the faculty and works to advance our academic mission of teaching, discovery, and educational access. By training, she's a molecular biologist, and she earned her bachelor's degree at Lehigh University and her master's degrees and PhD in molecular biophysics and biochemistry at Yale. And she's earned numerous recognitions in her field, but we want to listen to her, not listen to me, go on and on about all her accomplishments. Um, before joining the UW, she served as provost and senior vice chancellor for academic affairs at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. And at UMass, Tricia established initiatives to promote faculty scholarship and creative activity, particularly focusing on areas like sustainability, healthy aging, society and technology, inclusive excellence, data science, and mid-career research support. She also launched and led initiatives to increase diversity and equity for faculty, staff, and students. And one of the things that I really love about working with her is she's always focused on actionable change. She wants to get things done. And um, it's also important to note, because it's a real pride point for her and for us, that she is a first-generation college graduate. And her own experience with the transformative power of education to change lives and to change the world makes her mission as an educator very deeply personal. And so that is something that really makes her such an incredibly great advocate for opportunity for all. And um, she's also a great advocate for faculty, staff, and students. She's someone for whom fostering a community of educators, learners, and explorers who can collaborate to deal with the urgent challenges the world is facing 
is always front and center for her. And I know you'll be excited to hear from her, both her perspective of what she's learned about the university so far, but also what's on the horizon and where we're going and where she's leading. So please join me in welcoming Provost Tricia Sirio. Thank you so much, President Kause, uh, for that warm introduction today and for the introduction to this amazing university over the past six months. It's been absolutely wonderful. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging the Coast Salish peoples of this land I stand on, land which touches the shared waters of all tribes and bands within the Suquamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations. I'd also re like to recognize that in many parts of our world today, millions of people are suffering from natural disasters made worse by climate change and from wars, even as civilians, and that this pain extends to our communities here. It's truly my hope that our mission can promote understanding to ease these current crises, crises and to um, proactively help us to avoid the creation of new ones in the future. I want to thank uh, the regents, including Regent Zeke and Regent Harris and Regent Tamaki, who are here today in person, and also Regent Rice uh, and Regent Rhodes, who are joining remotely. And most importantly, thank you to all of you, um, faculty, staff, and even a few students, uh, for taking some time out of your day today to attend my first town hall, whether in person or online. Uh, as President Council mentioned, I'm a first generation to college graduate. Uh, and many of you have likely heard me say um, that my academic career has been my way to pay forward that tremendous and unexpected gift that I received by having the opportunity to earn a college degree. Um, in college, I found a passion for a subject that I didn't even know existed when I started school uh, in a career that has been beyond anything that I could have ever even imagined or articulated at that time. And for me, this is really the role of higher education to provide a path for us to look beyond our wildest dreams in so doing to proactively contribute to society in ways that are unique to each one of us. As provost, I really take my responsibility seriously. I strive to advocate for the needs of our university community, to facilitate connections across the amazing breadth of excellence uh, at our university, and to integrate our work with communities beyond the boundaries of our campuses. This work is really all with the goal of creating opportunities for faculty, staff, and students to transform their own passions and talents into far-reaching impact in the world. Over the past six months, I've been having a lot of fun uh, visiting uh, each of the schools and colleges and campuses, and I've witnessed firsthand how the University of Washington really excels at extending the experiences we have together to greater good. As a public R1 university, our faculty, staff, and students are thriving in an impact ecosystem that we create together. And as our mission statement says, discovery is at the heart of our university. And you know what drew me here is the prowess of our university in research and creative activity is known worldwide but yet the humility of the Pacific Northwest keeps us grounded in reality. It's a really special place. Um, I'm gonna do a lot of bragging today about things that everyone else has done, so I hope you'll bear with me. Uh, but I wanna note a few highlights uh, about just how exceptional our university is. Our arts programs offer more than 300 performances, exhibits, and public programs annually. Our researchers have attracted more than $1.87 billion per year in sponsored grants and contracts, and that's first in the nation among public universities. More than 400 patents and 2,000 license agreements have been signed for discoveries developed right here in the past five years. 
This one is a really good one. Last year, our students spent 32,000 hours serving their communities in 70 community-engaged courses. And that doesn't even touch on the myriad extracurricular activities of our faculty, staff, and students who regularly engage with and support our communities throughout the region and the state. UW-Tacoma researchers identified a chemical in tires as a culprit in the death of coho salmon in urban streams. UW Bothell was recognized by the Association for Advancement and Sustainability in Higher Education as a top performer for its grounds and water conservation. And UW Medicine cares for Washingtonians statewide through more than 1.7 million patient visits and per, by providing more than $800 million in uncompensated care for patients in need each year. That's pretty amazing. And the broader benefit of our community of faculty, staff, and students pursuing their passions at the University of Washington is clear. In total, our university contributes more than $15 billion in economic impact in the state annually. And nearly 82% of our undergraduate students choose to stay in the state of Washington when they finish their degrees. We're a state of Huskies. <laughs> uh, while these statistics are impressive on their own, what has really been truly awe-inspiring to me as, as I've gone around and, and met with everyone is the stories that create this impact. Recently, I visited uh, the robotics lab in the Allen School, and I heard about a robot that was promoting autonomy for a stroke survivor who is um, a non-speaking person with quadriplegia. Um, this robot, beyond the daily routines, uh, is helping him form a relationship with his toddler granddaughter by giving him the ability to play games with her for the first time. It was just absolutely spectacular. Um, and the group is really excited about the potential of this technology as a way to extend occupational therapy in a new direction. Um, and this is just one of the many, many examples I've heard about in the ways in which our expertise can be transformative in people's lives. While opportunities like this abound on our campus, it is so important for us to remain dedicated to keeping this world-class education accessible to Washington residents. Did you know that three quarters of our undergraduate students are from the state of Washington, hailing from all 39 counties? That means that we have 32,000 students from Washington studying at the University of Washington, and that's the largest number at any university in the state. Three quarters of transfer students' uh, applications from Washington Community Colleges are offered admission to the University of Washington. In-state, um, tuition and fees are far less than most of our peers, including the University of Oregon, which I've learned not to root for, um, and UCLA. Um, and, and we have better uniforms, I'll just say. Um, <laughs> And 64% uh, of our undergraduate students receive some form of financial aid. And that totals $450 million per year, including $120 million in institutional grants and scholarships to Washington residents. Uh, nearly one-third of our students receive support from the Washington College Grant and 22% from the Husky Promise, which covers all tuition and fees for Washington students with financial need. That's pretty amazing. Um, and we serve these students amazingly well in their Husky experience. 83% of our students graduate within six years, and nearly 85% of our graduates are employed or pursuing further education within months of their graduation. And here, too, the student stories are really expire, uh, inspiring. Um, on my visit to the College of the Environment, I met with a group of first-generation college students on the Rachel Carson. And I heard about how their opportunity to sail on that research vessel and to participate in projects through the Gooey Duck program helped them to find community at our university and also 
to realize for the first time that a career in science was accessible to them. As they shared their experiences, I was having flashback to my own, um, and, and I could just see their excitement and the transformative impact that that experience and others like it can have uh, for our students. I'm certain that you share my deep dedication to our mission and are motivated and inspired by these examples of our success. Um, and still, we must acknowledge that somehow this message has been lost for many people outside our university. As, we, as we've seen with an alarmingly increased frequency, universities, both public and private, across the country are under heightened scrutiny. And I'm certain that you've joined me in witnessing this rapidly shifting narrative. But even if we discount the past few months, uh, a Gallup survey last summer showed that Americans' confidence in higher education has fallen to 36%. And that's down from 57% just eight years ago. I've been thinking and talking with many of you about this higher education narrative over the past months. Um, and I, I've just been really deeply disappointed in it because the public perception just diverges so wildly from my own experience. Um, so I've been reflecting on this a lot. And what I've come to realize is that while our mission is unique in society, our place in the world doesn't place us above reproach. I think it instead holds us to a higher standard of responsibility, a dedication to critical thinking and assessment and ensuring that we double down on the things that matter, student success, affordability, research in areas of critical importance to the health of people and our planet, making democracy in our world better through open dialogue that values the perspectives of all. Every major piece of art and literature created every performance conceptualized, every discovery revealed, every technology developed came to be because someone looked at our world in a different way and chose to act. If we're to exist for the public good, we must protect and embrace the diversity of perspectives of our faculty, staff, and students and partner with society at large, both locally and globally, to prioritize impact that is accessible to everyone. We have, and we will continue to be challenged to do this, but if we truly believe in our mission, we must find ways, even if they're incremental, to continue to be in dialogue with one another as a model for the world. This is our responsibility. So in this context, I want to take a moment to just thank the Jackson School for International Studies and the College of Arts and Sciences for organizing a lecture series on the war in the Middle East. If you haven't been able to attend, I really encourage you to watch them online. They've been fabulous. I also want to thank the libraries for creating a research guide on the Israel-Hamas war, the law school and the School of Social Work for resources to develop skills and community dialogue, and the Faculty Senate for their partnership with me in organizing two upcoming workshops on free speech and academic freedom through PEN America. These are really important examples of the way in which we can leverage our mission to address the challenges our world faces through action rather than words alone. Why is this so important? I firmly believe that together we have something absolutely unique to offer the country and the world. At no other time in the history of the world will this group of people be working together in the same place and have the opportunity to co-create together. And we can only unleash that amazing and tremendous potential if every one of us has the freedom to contribute. In her annual address this year, President Kause challenged us to ask ourselves, what does the world need from this enduring institution in order to meet both the urgency of this moment and the challenges of coming eras that we can only imagine? Over the past few months, I've worked closely with the, my leadership team to articulate this responsibility for academic affairs. 
Um, and through much discussion, we've come to frame it through four guiding principles. Together, we strive to center an inclusive tri-campus community as the foundation of academic excellence. We cultivate partnerships to co-create equitable impact. We create opportunities for individuals to explore and pursue their passions by unleashing creativity and innovation. And we connect all aspects of our mission, research and scholarship, teaching and learning, service and outreach, to fulfill the vision of our public mission. As I visited the schools and colleges and campuses, I've seen firsthand these principles in action already through so many innovative programs, and I'm gonna brag on them again here. Um, but I really encourage you to learn more about them. Some of the highlights over the past couple months for me have been the College of Education's teacher preparation programs at the Othello UW Commons, the School of Social Work's behavioral health training for firefighters throughout the state, the Husky Post-Prison Pathways Program to create routes to and through the university at UW-Tacoma, the Policy Consulting Lab at the Evans School, the School of Nursing's yearly camp to expose high school students to the profession, the STEM Public Outreach Team of Student Ambassadors at uw Bothell who share presentations with the K-14 community, the Misinformation Escape Room created in the iSchool to build resilience to misinformation. Um, students in the School of Public Health who use their practica to improve access to mental health care for mothers. The strengthening of tribal institutions through the Native Law Center and the Law School. The Foster School Liberty Project to accelerate the growth of Black-owned businesses in Seattle and the School of Pharmacy's Global Medicine Program to improve access and affordability to life-saving therapies around the world. I have also been so deeply moved by the School of Dentistry and the School of Medicine's dedication to rural healthcare through training, both within our state and across the five-state Whammy region, respectively. And here I want to share one more story about the Nehemiah Initiative in the College of the Built Environments. On my recent visit, I heard from students across all the degree programs in the college who work together with faculty and community members to support local churches. Their goal is to disrupt the displacement of African American communities in Seattle by developing design concepts and recommending policy changes to facilitate the conversion of their unused land assets to affordable housing and community centers and businesses. The teams are really energized by integrating their unique perspectives and expertise in these holistic projects that really have the potential to transform communities. And they've become a model for universities across the country. It was absolutely inspiring. Um, beyond these examples, I've also seen a tremendous appetite uh, to capitalize on the unparalleled depth and breadth of our excellence, as President Kausai pointed out in her address earlier this year, to work across the academic units to contribute solutions to both the challenges and opportunities of today and tomorrow. So in my remaining time, uh, I'd like to tell you a little bit about our new initiatives and in academic affairs to meet this moment. First, as always, our work begins by centering our students as the future agents of change in our world. And to support their access and success, uh, we've formed two faculty and staff working groups. The first is on the future of teaching and learning, uh, with the goal of defining teaching excellence at the UW through a shared understanding of quality instruction and supports that can sustain it. And the second is on capacity and demand in our degree programs with the goal of examining the current state of capacity constrained majors by developing a common data informed definition, metrics to track constraints over time, and most importantly, recommendations to alleviate them. At the same time, we also have the momentum and expertise in research and scholarship and creative activity to lead national conversations in areas of global impact. And I would argue that we have an absolute responsibility to do so. 
Through the university initiative working group that was charged by President Kause, the deans, vice provosts, vice chancellors and chancellors and I have been developing plans to open up broader conversations among faculty, staff and students in four key areas. Climate solutions, democracy, behavioral health, and applied AI and the equitable and ethical use of technology. I encourage everyone to engage in these important conversations. Our goal is really to highlight the work that's currently being done at the UW and exciting new opportunities in these areas across the university. We want to articulate the unique value of the university and how we can contribute to advance each of these initiatives and to promote collaboration to accelerate our impact. This framework will also allow us to engage with the potential partners to ensure that our unique position is directed towards transformative impact in the world and that we have the support to realize our aspirations. We also believe that these university initiatives have important parallels for our own campuses. And I'm in conversation with leaders across the university, including the Faculty Senate, ASUW, and GPSS about joining the Okanagan Charter, which is a consortium of higher education institutions committed to centering health and well-being throughout their missions. For me, the charter is an obvious fit for the University of Washington and it would provide an organizing framework to increase the visibility of our university-based health and well-being efforts. And by aligning these efforts with the university initiatives, we'll ensure that the expertise that we bring to the world can also transform our own campuses for the better. One area in particular that President Kausai and I are prioritizing is artificial intelligence. We firmly believe that the UW has a responsibility to lead in this conversation, not only in potential applications, but in their ethical and equitable use. Developing an institutional strategy for AI is no longer a choice. It's an imperative for the University of Washington. We must empower faculty, staff, and students to use AI to innovate in their areas of expertise and interest through partnerships both within and external to the university. And regardless of their major, we must prepare our students to graduate with the skills and perspectives necessary to succeed in a world where AI is accessible to all. This work uh, will ensure that we remain nimble in a landscape of so many opportunities in such rapidly changing technology. This is a conversation that I firmly believe everyone in our university can contribute to and lend their expertise to shape the future of our world in very important ways. So today I'm pleased to announce a university-wide task force on artificial intelligence to build on our distinct opportunity to transform not only the university but our society through both foundational and use-inspired AI research and application. The task force will be co-chaired by Vice President for UWIT, Andreas Bowman, and Dean Aninde of the iSchool, and will initially divide its work into five areas. Research and knowledge creation and transfer, student services, teaching and learning, infrastructure, and administration. More information about the task force can be found on the provost website, and I'm grateful to all of you who will participate in this important work. And now, uh, to provide a frame for our opportunities in this area, I'd like to welcome two UW experts in AI. First uh, is Noah Smith, who is a professor in the Allen School and Senior Director of Natural Language Processing Research at the Allen Institute for AI. Professor Smith is a computer scientist working at the junction of natural language processing, machine learning, and computational social science. And Andy Connolly, who is an associate vice provost for data science and director of the eScience Institute, and the William P. and Ruth Gerberding University professor in the Department of Astronomy. Professor Connolly uses advanced image analytics, deep learning, and cloud computing to advance cosmology and solar system science 
through the design of some of the largest astronomical surveys in the world. Noah will address how the UW is situated as a major contributor to advances in AI and a potential leader in promoting AI literacy. And then Andy will address the potential for AI to support our mission across campus. So I invite Noah to join us. Thank you. Thank you, Provost Serio. Uh, I've been tasked with explaining artificial intelligence, and I've been given 10 minutes. Um, so uh, my, I was tempted to try and give a lecture, but my students talked me out of it. Uh, so I'm going to do my best with the time I have. And if you want a longer discussion, uh, go online, search for Language Models, A Guide for the Perplexed, which is a tutorial that two of my students wrote with me recently uh, to, uh, to introduce this important topic to a wide audience. The term artificial intelligence is all over the place these days, uh, but, but people don't always use it to mean the same thing. Uh, when we talk about AI, I urge everyone to remember that it doesn't refer to any specific technology or capability, just like the term intelligence is used to refer to a nebula nebulous set of characteristics in people. Um, I think of AI as actually more of a brand than a technical thing. Uh, further, the relationship between natural intelligence and artificial intelligence is hotly contested by experts. Lots of different opinions about this. Uh, one example, uh, you've heard of language models. Big part of the, the current conversation about artificial intelligence. Uh, these are a much more precisely definable technology, but not all AI is language models, and language models are not used in every AI system. I think language models and the commercial products that are built on them, like ChatGPT and its rivals, are one of a few key technologies that are bringing a lot of attention to AI right now, especially on university campuses. But they're not actually that new an idea, as we explain in A Guide for the Perplexed. Though the companies selling language models uh, go out of their way to avoid talking about their limitations, there's still quite a lot that these tools are not able to do right now. Uh, and I would say that characterizing the abilities and the limitations of language models is an active scientific research area. Uh, and it's not clear that the purveyor's uh, interests are well served by a deeper scientific understanding by the rest of us. So I think it falls on us at the university to do this work. Language models are essentially models of fluency. They predict what word is likely to come next after a sequence of words. For researchers in my field of natural language processing, it's amazing and quite surprising how far fluency with language can go. Many people are finding useful tools hiding in language models that researchers could have only dreamed about building just a few short years ago. We're still learning about this, but it's important for all of us in the scholarly community to remember that everything the models can do follows from what they are explicitly originally designed to do, predict the next word in a sequence uh, of words in English or other languages, um, and the data that was used to help them achieve that goal. It turns out that very high fluency creates some semblance of world knowledge, common sense, and even reasoning ability. And we can be surprised by this without believing that the models are magic, as a lot of the press narratives would have us think. The better we understand a technology, the better we can steer it towards goals that we care about. University of Washington faculty have been at the forefront of these recent fundamental advances for quite some time. For example, the famous ELMO paper ELMO stands for Embeddings from Language Models, uh, was published in 2018. Um, and it, was, it kicked off the language model craze. It was authored by Luke Zettelmoyer and other researchers here at the University of Washington and researchers at the Allen Institute for AI. Um, more recently, we've released um, uh, new open language models that will enable scientific study of the models themselves alongside the data used to train them. In my opinion, no university is better positioned than the University of Washington to drive this exciting technology in service of education, scholarship, and especially scientific discovery. Uh, developed and incorporated thoughtfully, AI will support our mission. Last spring, Vice Provost for Research Mari Ostendorf convened a great panel on demystifying ChatGPT, and faculty from across campus talked about creative ways of engaging and interrogating the technology alongside their students. Uh, I, I definitely recommend you find that video online if you weren't there for the panel last spring. 
Related to that, we're also well positioned to play a leading role in promoting wider understanding of AI technology in society. Who's going to define AI literacy and set the standard for other colleges and universities? I think this opportunity dovetails well with other UW initiatives, from the Center for an Informed Public to our leadership in data science education. Technologies like language models are here. They're not going away, uh, and it's our responsibility to work together with our students to define how they can be appropriately used and improved. And I look forward to talking with all of you more about this as this new uh, focus on AI grows at UW. And with that, I'm gonna hand over the podium to Andy Connolly. Thank you, Noah. So Noah had the opportunity and the challenge to cover the whole of AI in a few minutes. I have the challenge of covering the whole of AI across our campus in a few minutes. So you may want to play this back at half speed um, after the fact. So, and, and the reason for that is if we look at our campus, AI in all of its forms is already touching our research and education mission. Uh, two years ago, so before all the excitement about ChatGPT and the language models that Noah was talking about, two years ago, as part of an initiative called Discovering AI at UW, over 300 researchers came together on campus, and we talked about how we teach AI, how machine learning can be used in medicine, how the latest advances in natural language processing and computer vision might drive new research in physics and biology and more broadly. And in fact, one of the, um, one of the outcomes of that meeting, and again two years ago, was an informal working group to start thinking about what would a curriculum look like for this university that would teach AI? And in particular, a curriculum that doesn't just focus on STEM education, but thinks about the university as a whole. Today, there are 12 centers, in fact, over 12 centers and institutes on campus that address AI across a vast range of fields, from um, intelligent and smart technologies for agriculture to um, uh, understanding the needs of the language and uh, needs of uh, children. Um, David Baker and his group use generative AI. So generative AI is the same kind of principles that are used within the language models and chat GPT that Noah was talking about. But David Baker's group uses generative AI to design proteins, proteins that can be used for medicine and in drug discovery. Uh, Steve, um, Steve Brunton and Nathan Cutts, they lead an institute that are building advanced machine learning tools that are designed to control complex physical systems that we now use in neuroscience and fluid dynamics. Uh, um, Marine Dunal in Earth and Space Sciences has been working with AI to try to understand and predict how earthquakes and seismic waves propagate through the Earth. Uh, Ye Jin Choi from the Allen School and the AI2 has shown that if you combine text with images, they reinforce each other allowing us to better mimic how people gain knowledge and understanding about our universe. About our universe. And um, Min Sun from the College of Education has just started a program to understand how AI can be used to derive lesson plans for teaching mathematics in, uh, in high schools. Bringing the idea that AI might help us create personalized um, education for our students. And this goes along with what Tim Althoff has been doing in, in the Allen School, where he is using personalized medicine, how we can treat um, issues associated with, or use AI to treat issues associated with uh, mental health issues. So as Noah has said, UW is a leader in this field, both in the development of the techniques and the methods, but also the application of these techniques to solve problems across the whole of the campus. We use AI today to accelerate our discoveries. We use AI to amplify our creativity. But with leadership also comes responsibility. Universities are somewhat of a unique space, right? We bring people and ideas together to co-mingle. And I think the University of Washington is, is particularly, this is particularly relevant for the University of Washington where um, collaboration is, is really at our core. 
We're not driven to make money from AI, which means that we can be open and transparent about what AI can do, which as Noah has shown you is a lot, but also what it can't, which Noah has also shown you is a lot. We're broad. We will train the next generation of students who will take AI and apply it across all fields. But at the same time in educating them, we expose our students to philosophy and art and policy and law, as well as ethics and teaching them mathematics and computer science. So we have a responsibility to educate our students so that they're capable of imagining what AI can do how it can be deployed to solve problems, and as they move into the workforce, so that they can help organizations to, be, to adapt and evolve um, alongside AI. And our, our role as a university has always been to create a workforce populated by individuals, individuals who are intellectually nimble, who are curious, who think critically, and I think even in the era of AI, this remains the same mission that we have for our university. And in fact, maybe it becomes even more important as we see AI emerging. So if we're to develop a responsible approach to AI, we need to be, continue to be at the forefront of the advances in AI. And this means the advances in methods, in the application, and in education. Education meaning both how we teach AI and how we use AI to teach our students. Doing so is important for society, but it's also important for us in terms of our roles as educators and researchers. And it's in this way that I think really touches on what one of the key points to Noah's remarks is, we, if we do this, then we get to decide what an AI literate student body and workforce looks like both today and in the future. So I hope as we begin to build out this program for AI across campus that you will feel both welcomed and empowered to be part of these conversations and discussions, to talk about the challenges that we face from AI, but also to discuss the opportunities that we have from AI to transform how we act and work as a university, both in our mission for education and research. Because I think in that way, we then get to define and build a community that reflects our values as a university and our values in education, in research, and creating this workforce that won't just use AI, but will drive it forward in ways that are responsible, understanding what it can do, understanding what it can't do, and understanding how we engage with AI and empower our students uh, to engage, engage with AI in the future. Thank you. And with that, I'd like to welcome Professor Sirio, um, Provost Sirio back to, uh, back to the stage. Thank you. Thank you both, Noah and Andy, uh, for framing the possible for us. Um, this, I think, opportunity perfectly captures the spirit of the University of Washington for me. This institution has never been constrained by what has always been done in the past, but rather uses its foundation as a launching pad for transformative impact through our openness to, to new paths forward. This past year, uh, people across our country have seen the essence of the University of Washington more than ever before. Uh, on the movie screen and the football field, um, They've taken note of our tenacity, our teamwork, and our collaboration. Aspects of the unique ethos of uh, this university that transpires every day in our classrooms, labs, studios, and communities. The people who make up this university are the foundation of our widely recognized academic excellence. And I'm truly honored to walk alongside of you as we show the world what we can achieve together for Washington and the world. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Provost Serio. Um, so we now have uh, some time for questions. And I'll begin with a selection of questions that were submitted by members of the UW community 
prior to today's town hall, and uh, these have been edited for length. Uh, in, in some cases, we have multiple uh, uh, questions on the similar topics, so we kind of summarize in, in some cases. Um, if you would like to ask Provost Sirio a question now, please, again, email it to provost at uw.edu. Um, we will not have time during this program necessarily to answer every question that's submitted, uh, but the provost team will respond if, uh, individually to each questioner. So we'll start with, um, do you anticipate any changes to the university's policy on remote work, and how, the how will the university address remote work for staff whose roles do not require them to be on campus regularly? Thanks, Victor. Um, so, you know, coming out of the, or, or through the pandemic, I think we've realized the, um, the benefits of, of having uh, remote options, right? It decreases uh, environmental impact by reducing commuting, promotes work-life balance and flexibility for people. Um, and um, I think all of these things are important and they need to be balanced with the, the mission and work that has to happen at our university. So I think, you know, coming from the outside and looking at the policies, for me, I think they're in, in the right place in that um, they provide some guidelines for each of the units to follow, but also the flexibility locally to match the work that needs to be done in the way that it, it, it can best be done. And that's a combination of the specific duties for each position, the readiness of the person to work remotely, uh, the readiness of that unit to have remote workers and so forth. Um, so we don't anticipate any changes right now in the remote work policies, but I encourage everyone to go to the HR website where they can find more information uh, about where we currently are. All right, thank you. Uh, Stick with, stick with me on this one, it's a little bit longer. Um, okay. uh, finance transformation has been a challenge for many across the university. Pause, pause for laughter, oh, okay. Um, I'm surprised this was a question. <laughs> uh, especially those who rely on grants and contracts. Administrative staff have had difficulty getting accurate budget information and ensuring compliance with federal regulations. What is the administration doing to solve issues like these and address the ad extra administrative costs associated with finance transformation. Yeah, thank you. I, this is obviously a really serious uh, matter. Uh, and I, I wanna say, you know, as a grant-funded researcher myself, I hear you and I understand uh, the difficulties that the community has faced uh, and your frustration. Um, I, what I wanna say is coming from another university and coming in, um, in the context of acknowledging that this has been difficult, this was absolutely a necessary thing to do for a university of this size, scale, and scope, not to have a unified financial system was a tremendous risk that is, just couldn't be accepted. Um, so I think now our, our opportunity is to, to find the path forward so that we can realize uh, the benefit of having this unified system. Um, and again, I want to acknowledge that, that this has been, been a difficult thing for, for all. Um, but I also want to acknowledge that part of the difficulty is really also the rationale for having to do this, right? Business processes and, and structures and support systems throughout the university were happening in wildly different ways. And that's been part of the challenge to try to align them with a unified system. And so in some ways it highlights the difficulty as well. So what, what are we going to do? Um, so first, I, I really want to highlight the leadership of both Sarah Norris Hall, uh, Margaret Shepard, and Mari Ostendorf, especially in the, in the research space, who have been working incredibly hard with their teams to uh, understand the scope of the problem and to map out solutions. As you all know, there's new leadership in uh, the combined finance planning and budget team, and I have tremendous confidence in the plan that they've come up with to navigate us through the current challenges. Um, some things that they've done, and also recognizing that there's more to do. Um, they've increased transparency by expanding the number of dashboards and, and, will, and are working on a, a more regular communication strategy. Um, we've hired six additional uh, folks centrally to help clear backlogs. 
We've engaged a new consultant that can help us redefine our business practices to, so that they're aligned and, and supported uh, in the current structure um, and to help us with the backlog as well. Um, this costs money, it absolutely does, but I think it's absolutely important for us to get through this period of time so that we can realize the benefit of the investment that we've already made, and I'm really confident that we will get there. The one thing I'll ask is, uh, or, and maybe just highlight, is um, no one wants to be in the position that we're in, and everyone is working incredibly hard to, to navigate through this situation as quickly and effectively and efficiently as possible. And that includes the tremendous people who, who are uh, staff members of this university. So while acknowledging your frustration, I really want to encourage you to give them the grace and the time to work through this. And we're all in this together, and let's try to work together to, to navigate it as quickly as possible. And my thanks to all of you for your patience and your hard work. Thank you. Um, this one is, uh, as a university characterized by our state's leadership in technological innovation, can you share more specifics about our roles and responsibilities in contributing to its equitable use and development, both within the university and throughout the state? Absolutely. Thanks for this question. This is something that's really important, and I think it highlights um, the comments that, that Noah and Andy shared with all of us. Um, technology can be used for good and, and for not so good. And I think that having um, the expertise that we have in this university places us in a position of great responsibility uh, to lead in that discussion about how to equitably and um, ethically use that technology as it's being developed. I think Knowing where those pitfalls are requires a deep knowledge of the technology and an understanding of where it's evolving and, and headed. And I feel like we have that ecosystem here at the university. This task force that we've put together, one of the charge, I mentioned five areas of focus, one of the charges for each of those working groups is to identify issues around equity and ethics that we need to have on our radar and to prioritize that in the work of, of the task force. So, and this is why I know there's a lot of anxiety uh, around AI. This is why we need everybody in the conversation because we need to understand what people are worried about so that we can develop approaches to address that and to really guide the world. Thank you. Um, so safety is a significant concern across the university. Uh, one writer asks what the university is doing to address property thefts, damage to cars, graffiti, cleanliness of parking garages, uh, and unhoused people who are residing on campus and in buildings. Uh, what is the role, also what is the role of uh, building coordinators and how are they supported? Yeah, thank you very much for that. I can tell you that for both President Kelsey and I and all of the senior leaders at the university, safety is an incredibly important issue for all of us. One of the very first meetings that I had when I came uh, to the university in August was, was, was with Sally Clark and her team, and I'm grateful for her leadership in this space. Um, the reality of the situation is you know, the impacts of the pandemic on mental health more broadly, um, the economic conditions of our country, the rise of um, addiction and, and many other issues are, are all converging, uh, especially in urban centers across the country, and our region is certainly uh, not immune from that. We are a public university, and so we are in community with our surrounding area, and so um, we need to work on these issues together. Um, again, acknowledging that, that we have more work to do, I just want to thank all those who have been deeply engaged in this work in finding a path forward. So to share just a few things, um, we've increased um, lighting on campus, we've increased um, uh, security cameras, we've increased um, security in parking garages and in central areas uh, on campus, especially at night. We've trimmed back vegetation to increase visibility. Um, the UW alert system has been changed for students to opt out, so everyone's enrolled and they can hear about emergencies in real time as quickly as possible. Um, 
I also um, want to acknowledge the, the important role of building coordinators here. Uh, UW Facilities is engaging more directly with them. And also, I want to acknowledge our custodial workers who are often on the front lines uh, of issues in buildings. Uh, and we very much value the local work that is being done, uh, and we'll do what we can to support you centrally. And, and I feel like that network is, is very well connected. I also want to highlight uh, one thing that we've done is hired an a outreach coordinator to support people who are experiencing homelessness or are unwell in our campus spaces. So if you see one who, someone who is in need of services and support, please call the UWPD uh, non-emergency number uh, to connect them with our, our outreach coordinator. Um, it's part of, of taking care of our community together. All right. Um, I think we can fit in two more, but um, okay. we'll, we'll, we'll go with this one first. What efforts will the UW make toward carbon emissions reductions in the coming year and years? Yeah. So um, climate change uh, is an existential threat to, to all of us. Um, and I, this is another area. We talked a lot about AI this morning in which I think the university uh, is a leader already and will continue to lead. As you know, we have the largest college of the environment uh, of any university in the country. Um, and we're already uh, leading the conversation. For example, we're a founding member of the New York Climate Exchange. So we're going to be in the lead of developing solutions there. Um, but our work on our own campus is equally important there. Um, and I'm grateful to the, the committee who's been working on this and also um, to the regents for their support of our efforts to address uh, sustainability and carbon emissions on our own campus. Some of the things that you've likely heard about already is uh, the commitment by the Board of Regents to um, eliminate our investments in fossil fuels uh, by 2027, um, and our commitment to work together to uh, find solutions for our steam plant, which is the larger, largest source of our carbon emissions on campus. The price tag for doing that with a 600-acre campus that includes uh, hospitals is uh, somewhere between $700 million and $900 million. Uh, but we're committed to working um, with the state and federal opportunities to try to uh, raise the funds to, to move forward those projects. And I want to be clear that this reduction of our carbon footprint is the centerpiece of our um, energy uh, program through UW facilities that's been endorsed by the Board of Regents. So, I feel like everyone is aligned on this from research to, to practice um, and to our support services. Thanks. And uh, yeah, I want to be mindful of the time, but also wanted to reach this, uh, this timely question. What are we doing to address the FAFSA delays? Yes, FAFSA. Uh, lots, lots on my mind about this now. Um, for those of you who, who don't know, the federal um, financial aid system is undergoing a, a transition. and information that would normally come to us has been delayed. Um, so we're in constant conversation about this. The, the deadline for financial aid applications, the priority deadline will stay the same, February 28th. Um, and admitted students day will stay the same, April 20th. It's our goal to get uh, offers of admission out on the same timeline, which is uh, mid-March. Um, but we are closely tracking when information will come, and we will adjust, if needed, uh, the timeline for student acceptance based on when we can get them information about their financial aid packages. Um, we want everybody to know that we'll work through this just like every other university in the country. And for anyone who has questions, just please stay in contact with us, uh, and we'll share information uh, as quickly as we can. Okay, our time has come to an end. Thank you, uh, Provost Sirio, and th thank you all for joining us and uh, taking part in this important conversation. Uh, for those in attendance, we invite you to a reception in Alder Commons that is just through the doors at the back of the auditorium. Thank you all. Go Huskies. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you.